Greg and Jessica are in Plattsburgh uh, this morning speaking over at NTC Plattsburgh. Uh, we started Plattsburgh uh, about seven and a half years ago, NTC Plattsburgh, and our previous pastor, Don Curry, uh, went over to help start or to lead starting a church in Plattsburgh, New York. And Greg and Jess are over there. I think I wrote down, it's been four weeks. Yeah, it's been four weeks since Greg has spoken. He hasn't left. <laughs> He's still our lead pastor. Uh, I know somebody commented last week, are we ever going to hear from Greg again? Uh, you will, although next week, uh, Pastor Tom Wells, Tom Wells started NTC, started New Testament Church in 1981, and he is our founding pastor. He's in Ogdensburg uh, this morning, but next week he's going to be here in Messina. Greg will be here, he'll MC, uh, but next week we'll get to hear um, from Pastor Tom Wells. As Julie mentioned earlier, you know, we give 10%. Um, directly into our missions uh, budget um, as a church. And really, uh, and just to continue to brag on us a little bit, um, you know, there's there's only a handful of churches that ever start another church. About 2% of churches ever start another church. Uh, but really what, what Tom Wells and and the, the leaders that have come before us and really all, all the people um, that have come before us to, to start this church really put into the fabric of our church the idea of helping strengthen other churches. And, and to start other churches. So in 1994, Tom went to Williamsburg, Virginia to help start, or I say help, to lead starting a church in Williamsburg. They're going strong. As I mentioned last week, we set in um, a new pastor there after 29 years. And they move on, they're under a third pastor. And we get to be a part of helping strengthen and come alongside and start churches, which is really awesome. And we do that together. We've sent, I remember back in 1994, I was in, I was in high school and we, we sent about 80 people moved from Messina, New York down to Williamsburg, Virginia to start a church, which is pretty incredible. We sent finances for, for many years over there. And in 2008, we sent Adam Avery and, and a bunch of other people over to, to Burlington to start a church there and, and for years helped financially to get that church off the ground and many other churches. So we get, we've done that together, and so we're interested in not just Messina, the North Country, although that's where our heart is. That's where this is where we reside. This is this is our this is our neighborhood. But we care about the world. We care about every person, and we care about churches being established to, to lead more people because God, God desires for all people to come to know Him, and that's our desire as well. So really, really cool that we get to be a part of that. Well, I'm, this morning I'm going to be wrapping up our series on worship. This is our seventh Sunday talking specifically about worship. We will continue to talk about worship for as long as we talk because worship is one of our core values as a church and it will continue to be one of our core values. But we've been spending this time just to, to focus on that value, the value of worship. And this morning I just wanted to continue a thought that I, that I unpacked last week in talking about the series of tents and tabernacles and temples that we see throughout the Old Testament and coming into the New Testament, some of the language um, that's used to speak of, of Jesus is even using that language that Jesus came, and literally it says that Jesus came and he tabernacled among us. Using that word, the tabernacle, the way that Moses set up in the book of Exodus, is used to say what Jesus did when he came and he lived and the, it, when he lived here. The message translation says that Jesus came and he moved into the neighborhood. But the actual word is tabernacle, is that he set up shop here. His presence was here, here on earth. And so we see a series of tents and tabernacles and temples. We talked about Solomon building the temple and all of that. But places throughout the Old Testament where God's presence would, would settle amongst his people. And, and we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see God's presence settling in, in a location, settling in a place in the middle of the, the little of the, of, the, of the Israelites in the tent or in the tabernacle or later in the temple. And questions arise, excuse me, questions arise when we start diving into the Old Testament. And, and I, I, I tend to get a, a number of questions and, and really just trying to understand, you know, when we talk about the law or we talk about the instructions that are in the Old Testament, the questions arise about, well, what, is, what does this mean? And how does this apply? And, and do we still do this? And there's questions even of how do, we, how do we read the Bible? And there's a general desire when I, when I talk to people and, you know, how many times have you heard somebody say, or, or have you ever heard somebody say, maybe start in the book of John. If you, if you want to get to know Jesus, if you want to dive into the scriptures, start in the book of John. 
which is really kind of a, a weird thing to say without context because you're telling somebody, if you want to read the Bible and understand what it says, start here. You know, start almost all the way through. We don't do that with any other book, do we? Do you ever pick up a book? Maybe sometime, maybe a, a few books, but for the most part, when, you, when we pick up a book, we tend to start here. And that's a, that's a, a good desire, but as I've talked to people, and a number of people even this week, saying that they, they start on page one, and they get, some of them get farther than others, some of you get farther than others, but you get into, into Numbers or Leviticus, and you just get, what is going on? <laughs> you get lost. Because the Bible is an amazing, beautiful book, but it's not like other books. I, I like to describe it as a library of books because the Bible is made up of pieces of literature over several thousand years of, of, of history that are put together. And the, then the, there's sections to the Bible. Even if you know, have a desire, and, and somebody this week came and said, well, I just want to read it chronologically. Well, that's going to be pretty difficult because you can read chronologically and you get up to about Chronicles and then it stops going chronological. Actually, Chronicles repeats uh, what's in Kings. So you're like, wait a second, I thought I already read this. Actually, going back, even, even Deuteronomy, you're like, I thought I already read this when I read Leviticus. Because Deuteronomy is a retelling of the law. And so there, there's sections in the Bible, and there's also different types, of, different types of literature in the Bible. There's stories, and then there's immense sections of poetry, which personally is a little bit harder for me. I'm, I'm better with story than I am with poetry. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But there's, there's poetry and, and there's different types of literature in the Bible. There's also very similar pieces in the Bible. I already mentioned that Chronicles is almost a repeat of, of Samuel, though it's, it's definitely not, or I'm sorry, of Kings. And now Deuteronomy is, is kind of a repeat of, of Leviticus, although it's not completely. And then we have the Gospels, the four different tellings of, of the life of Jesus. And there's, there's stories in there that repeat and so without you know, knowing that, you can kind of get lost trying, trying to read through and trying to navigate through the scriptures. The scriptures can be a tough thing to read, to read through. But we want to talk about how, when we, when we read the Old Testament, like what we kind of want to ask ourselves is, how do we apply this and what do we apply? Well, the New Testament tells us at least three things about, about reading the Old Testament. First of all, the New Testament tells us how to read the Old Testament. We see, we see the, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and also Paul, they quote from the Old Testament continually. And we, when we see how they quote and how they interpret and how they, how they say, well, this passage means this, that teaches us how to read the Old Testament. The New Testament is also a filter. I mentioned last week that Jesus gives us the cliff notes for the law. Jesus says all the law can be summed up in this, love God and love each other. And that's, that's the the boiled down cliff notes of, of the law, that it all relates to loving God and loving each other. And we, we need to be able to see that. As well, the, the New Testament tells us what, what continues, because there's things that are in the Old Testament that don't continue for us today. I was telling somebody this week about the story in the book of Acts where Peter has a vision of some animals and those animals in the Old Testament are unclean. Those animals are animals that you're not supposed to eat. And God tells Peter, kill and eat, which is very good because I like bacon. You know, there are some laws in the Old Testament that don't carry through, but the Bible doesn't, doesn't, let us, doesn't put you in the dark. It, it tells you, but there's a lot of words here. I, I also like to remind people that if you take the scriptures and you put it on normal size paper and normal size font, it would be a huge book. It would be, uh, we'd all be carrying around, and I've seen Bibles like that, huge Bibles carrying around and it just weighs 50 pounds. It's a, it's a big book, but it's, also, it's an incredible book and it's something that we want to wrestle through continually. But like anything, the more that you read it, the more you can understand it. How, how many times have you rewatched a movie and caught something different? You know, we know that. Well, we should remember that when, it, when we come to the Bible. There's layers and there's depth and there's, there's things that you don't catch the first time around. 
And so we, we, we pick it up again and, and we read it and we interact with each other and people say, well, don't you remember that, that this has to do with this over here? And you're like, oh, that makes more sense. Well, we are called New Testament Church for a reason. And that reason is that we don't agree with the Old Testament. No, I'm just kidding. That's not true. I don't know how many times over the last 40 years people have asked me, do you, do you read the Old Testament? <laughs> You know, you say your New Testament. Yes, we read the whole Bible. We affirm the whole Bible cover to cover. This is what God has, has passed down to us through, through history. We have the whole scriptures and it all is, is, is fruitful and, and for our benefit. But there's, there's a difference that happens in the way that God relates to people um, that carries through. And there's a change that happens specifically in the life of Jesus and then in what follows the life of Jesus. And we see in the book of Acts, the church being set up that is where we are continuing from. And so we read the book of Acts and we see the church established in a new in, in a new way in the book of Acts. And that's where we're trying to continue that into history, into, into revelation, bringing, bringing all of God's promises um, before us. And so we are New Testament church, but let's follow this shift that happens from the Old Testament to the New Testament. In Genesis 1, in the first couple verses, uh, we read about the Holy Spirit hovering over the waters of creation. That from the from the first couple verses of of the Bible, we see the presence of God, the presence of God uh, interacting with His creation. That God didn't just speak and and let it exist; He engaged, and the Holy Spirit is there, hovering over the waters. We, we come to Genesis chapter 3, and we, we read about Adam and Eve walking in the cool of the, of the garden, walking, and, and there's, this, there's this illusion or this, this sense that they're used to walking with God in the garden, that God's presence is something that they're, they're familiar with. And, and as we follow through, through the book of Genesis, we see a number of people having really interesting interactions with God. Abraham makes a meal for God and sits down around the fire and shares a meal with God, which shouldn't surprise us later when Jesus then makes a meal for his disciples after his resurrection, and he eats, he eats, and he, and he hands them food and does that in front of them, that God desires to live and, and breathe and, and interact and eat with us. His presence um, interacts in different ways. I see even, even throughout the Old Testament, there's a number of, of, of instances where the Holy Spirit where, where, the, where God rests on an individual for a purpose. And we see that a number of times um, throughout the Old Testament. And then we come to Jesus. And Jesus, when, when he's baptized, it says that the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. And Jesus, in, in a sense, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a, a we'll just wrap our brains around that. I love the, the picture of Jesus' baptism where Jesus goes into the water and it says the heavens open and the voice of God speaks over Jesus and the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus. And I would love to just spend the whole rest of the time just talking about that. But what we see in the presence of God is that the presence of God fills Jesus. He's God, but he is set aside. Paul later tells us that for a season, Jesus set aside his divineness to become a human. And so he sets something aside, whatever that is. And then at his baptism, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus later says, I, I only do what the Father tells me to do, and I do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus shows us what it looks like to be one who's filled with the Holy Spirit, who has God in him, with him, and doing amazing things. But then later, Jesus says to his disciples, it's better for you that I go to which I'm sure they said, are you sure? <laughs> but Jesus says, it's better for you that I go because after I do what I'm going to do, after I, 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 I die and I, and I rise again and, and I change history, after that happens, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to fill each and every one of you. And there's going to be a change in the way that God's presence comes amongst his people after Jesus rises from the dead. And he gives his, his disciples instructions to go and pray until that happens. And in Acts chapter 1 and 2, we read that how his disciples are praying and then the Holy Spirit comes and fills them up. 
And then what happens throughout, throughout the book of Acts is they go and they do amazing things in the power of the Spirit. But what we see, as, I, as, I'm, as I'm trying to lay out, what we see from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelations 21 and 22, what we see is God's desire to dwell with his people, his creation, his desire to, to, to interact and then to be a part and, and to fill up and to empower and to have relationship. But there's a shift that happens, and that's where we're going to go back just for a minute to the tent, tabernacle, and temple of the Old Testament. See, Israel, as I said last week, Israel was to be known as a people where God's presence dwelt. And in the book of Exodus, after the Israelites, they, they come out of Egypt, they come out of slavery, and they come to the mountain where Moses had, had met with God previously. God says, I, I'll have the people wash themselves and prepare to come meet me and have them come up and I'm going to come and I'm going I'm to dwell with them. But as you follow the story, Israel gets a little freaked out and they say, well, Moses, you just go. Moses, you go talk to God and then you come back and tell us what God says. And we see in, the, in those verses where God had said, my desire is for you to be a nation of priests, a kingdom of priests, that you all, all of Israel will be priests that will show the world who I am. And they say, Moses, you just be a priest. And then we see the priesthood develop and Levites and all, and all of that. But what, what we see, what I said last week, is we see that God responds to their response. And we see the temple and the tabernacle um, set up as a result of that. In Genesis uh, chapter 32, this is roll back in time a little bit. God had given a promise to Abraham, and that promise was for his children's children and descendants that would come after. And we see, we see throughout Genesis, Abraham's life, and then we see his, his son um, Isaac's life, and then his son Jacob's life. And we come to Jacob um, in Genesis chapter 32 and verse 28. Uh, Jacob had had a dream, and he, and he woke up, and he, was, he had been wrestling with an angel, or wrestling with, with God. And he has this, this, inner, this, this conversation with God. And then it says, then he said, this is God speaking to Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, which we talked about this even recently, that Jacob's that name kind of has the connotation of a deceiver, which Jacob definitely was a deceiver. But Jacob, uh, your, no, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. And, and we see that the name, the name Israel is one who, who wrestles with God. And as here it says, that and prevails. But it also has the connotation of endured. Because Jacob doesn't prevail over the one he wrestles with. <laughs> he just barely hangs on there and then God touches his hip and he, he's done for. But he endured. He wrestled. He stuck in with God. He didn't want to let go. And so this man who was previously named Jacob is now named Israel. And all of his descendants become the Israelites, meaning a people who wrestle with God and endure, who, who go through life and, they, and they, they follow and they're in and they stick with it. And this people that come from Jacob, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, become known as a people who wrestle with God, a people who are known by the presence of God, a people who are known where God's presence dwells. And as I said, he dwells in different ways throughout the Old Testament, but the idea is, is that they are known as a people that are connected with the presence of God, that the presence of God in their midst is meaningful. And so we see that this system established, and it's, it's an, an unusual system. And I had somebody this week uh, message me that they were, they were reading, I think it was in, I think it was in Numbers or Leviticus, but they're reading about how, how some of the people that take care uh, of, the, of the tabernacle, that they would have to be blindfolded when they're washing the different instruments so that when they go in, they don't actually see what they're looking at, but they're cleansing the tabernacle to prepare it. And it's just like, what? This person was saying, what? What is going on there? And I said, actually, keep, keep reading because what it describes is that in, in, in the tabernacle system, in the, in, the, in the system that's laid out, 
only once a year does somebody actually go into the to the to the center of the tent where the holy of holies where the god's presence dwells only once a year one person goes in there and it's it's limited to that and there's reasons for that and there's a lot that goes into that but when we come to to hebrews chapter 10 in hebrews chapter 10 verse 19 this is much later in the new testament it says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. And, and previous to this, he describes so only in, in the book of Hebrews, as I just said, he describes so only once a year the high priest even goes into the holy of holies. And so Jesus is going gonna, is gonna to change, as I said earlier, Jesus is going to change the way that God relates to us and the way that we relate to God through what he does on the cross and then sending the Holy Spirit. And what we need to remember is that as I said earlier, the New Testament helps us understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament helps us understand the New Testament as well. You know, even in some of the songs that we sang this morning, I wrote them down. Some of the lyrics we said where it says, my water, or water my enemies drown in. There was a, there, we, we sang that. Water my enemies drown in, or shout that brings Jericho down. Those are references to stories in the Old Testament. And if you don't know the story, you can be like, well, what are we talking about? Water that our enemies drown in. But I, I, I watched a movie on Friday night, and this is not an endorsement, by the way. By the way, everything that we say is not an endorsement. <laughs> but I watched Guardians of the Galaxy 3 on, on, on Friday night with, with my son. And there's a character in the Guardians, his name is Drax, this, this Drax the Destroyer. And Drax is very literal. He's very logical. Metaphor is lost on Drax. And there's a, there's a moment where Drax repeats what somebody told him to repeat, and somebody says, that actually made sense, Drax. And he's like, he doesn't even understand what he's saying. And I kind of thought, like, That's, I'm kind of like that. I'm very literal, very, very logical. Metaphors are often lost on me. And how so often I'll, I'll, I'll look at the lyrics of a song, any song, not just worship song, but I'll look at the lyrics of a song, and I'm like, I don't even know what this is saying. <laughs> It's, there's too much poetry and metaphor and analogy. And I'm like, oh. and Gabe, the song about life as a subway, well, Our Lady Peace, go back to high school. <laughs> That's one of my favorite songs. Sorry, not an endorsement. But I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> so sometimes there, there's things that are described in the New Testament that you have to go back and you have to see what that goes back to history, go back to the Old Testament to understand what is being said and to really get what, what is being described. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus, because of what Jesus did, he's saying. By his death, by, by what Jesus did, because of what Jesus did, Jesus opened a new life, giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. And he describes previously, the, the writer of Hebrews describes previously how, you know, in the temple, in the tabernacle, there's a, there's a, there's a, a curtain that's hung up between the holy place and the most holy place. And the, as I said, only the high priest once a year goes into the most holy place, and they have this huge curtain. There, there's some estimates that the curtain in Jesus' day was, was like a foot thick. Is that right? Somebody help me out with that. There's just this thick, thick, foot thick curtain, <laughs> curtain that divides the holy place from the most holy place. And when we read the account of Jesus' death, that when Jesus died, it says the curtain was torn in two. And what that means is that curtain that previously kept us from entering into the presence of God, that curtain is ripped in two, making all access for all people everywhere to come into the presence of God, which is different than how God had been relating to Israel because of Israel's reaction in an Exodus, as I talked about earlier. And so Jesus makes a way for his presence, for God's presence to be accessible for all of us. Ephesians 2, 19 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens and the saints and members of the household of God, 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That the scriptures describe that we are meant to be a dwelling place for God's presence. And together, what we see here in Ephesians chapter 2 is together we are forming a temple together where God's presence can dwell. And that's kind of our heart in, in worship, and worship being described throughout, throughout the scriptures and, and, and all the things that we've talked about over the last seven weeks. But really what, what it comes down to in worship is worshiping God and encountering his presence. That's what, our, that's what we're in this for, is to be in God's presence. I'm going to have some, some members of the worship team come on up to, to talk, not to play. Uh, Bill Jaggers, Josh D'Souza, Gabby, she's going to pass off the baby, and Olivia are going to come on up. We can, we can welcome them up. Last scripture I have is Revelations 21, and, and Revelation is is a is a revelation is is a vision that that John receives that he passes on to us of, of things that are going to happen. And in in Revelations chapter 21, at the end of time, it describes the behold a dwelling place. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man; he will dwell with them and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. The, the desire from Genesis chapter 1 all the way to Revelations 21 and 22 is for God's presence, for God to dwell with his people, for him to be God, and we to be us, and to, and, and to, and to understand the presence of God. So I wanted, I wanted to hear from some members of our worship team who lead us in worship, and the question that I had for them, and, and they've, already, they've already asked them, I already gave them a heads up a little bit, is, you know, why do you worship? What, what, why are you passionate about worship? What, what drives you in worship? And even in coming, and they come early on Sunday morning, especially now that our service begins at 9 a.m., they're here extra early uh, on Sunday morning. They, they log in to their resources during the week to, to see the songs and to, to practice them in order to, to lead us in worship. And I just want to ask you, why? Why do you do it? For me, I feel like um, it started with just a simple passion for music. And then um, I joined the kids worship team when we had like a live band downstairs. And that's where I feel like I had a real encounter with the Holy Spirit through worship. And that to this day has been where I feel God and feel connected the deepest and um, God always uses music and worship to speak to me and talk to me and that personal connection that I have with God makes drives me to want to lead others to have that as well. That's good. So worship, talk to me about your, your heart, your passion for worship. Um, for me, it's always been, um, I don't know. My, my mom always says like, whenever you do something, do it like God is watching. Um, whether it's, um, you know, stuff you don't like doing or stuff you even enjoy doing. Um, and I remember for me, when I started playing drums, um, it was actually a music camp, um, at, at, at NTC that Chris Lincoln did. And to be honest, I was objectively the worst drummer at that camp. I was, I remember uh, going and I, I, I don't know, I was just like incredibly disheartened after the week because I was like, wow, I am terrible. <laughs> but um, I don't know, my, my uncle, Kuhn, Jen, and my mom were like, no, you should, you should continue to play. 
Um, and I just kept remembering what my mom says, like, you know, just do, do it, do it like God is watching. And I just kept working at it. And for me, it's like, um, it's like that, that lyric from one of my favorite songs, you know, it's like, if, um, who am I to think your glory, uh, needs my praises. If this borrowed breath is yours, Lord, take it all. So like, even in, even my, my little, whatever I can do behind the drum kit, if, if that's what I bring, you know, like I, I want it to be my best for him. So. Bill, I remember you and Amy were uh, um, working at Chattagay Central School for, for a season. And for a season, uh, we're over at a church um, outside of New Testament Church. You're over in Burke. And you, you picked up a guitar, I think, late in life. And that, you're, not that you're late in life, but... <laughs> Yeah, you were even trying I'm to barely get, the oldest one up here. You were trying to get me to pick up a guitar, and I, yeah. I did when I was at your house, but then put it down. But <laughs> yeah, I didn't even own a guitar until I was thirty. Um, I learned worship in this house. I didn't know how to play an instrument, but I learned how to worship. I was taught here. Uh, my wife Amy and I went to a small church um, out in Burke, New York, and we were asked to lead the youth group there in a bedroom in their house and we had nothing. And I knew deep down that we needed, uh, we needed worship. And so I taught myself how to play guitar and that was sort of the beginning for me. Um, so that was a while ago. So about 22 years ago now that I've been, you know, I've been doing this. And for me, basically like my walk with God, it changes almost by the hour. I mean, sometimes, I feel close to him. Uh, sometimes he feels far away. And, and, but whenever I'm worshiping, especially when I'm on stage, it never fails to connect me with him in, in, a, in a very unique way. I mean, we can pray and be connected with him. We can read the word and be connected we, through relationship, through living a mess, hearing a message, and even worshiping um, you know, with the radio on in my car. And those are all different avenues that we can worship God. But when I'm up on stage, it's like this, it's, it's a very unique way that I can, I can connect with him. I can actively participate and worship um, with my team and with you. And for me personally, it's just a very unique way for me to connect to God that is just special to me. Good. Olivia, you're, you're newer to the team and you have an incredible voice. And we've, we've appreciated that also through the musicals that you've done at Nor Norfolk and and now singing here on the team. Is there anything that you want to share with just what worship has meant to you? So yeah, I start, like Gabby, I start with the team. Switch. <laughs> like Gabby, um, it started off as a passion of just singing. And like growing up here in the church, I loved worship. I was so drawn to it at just a young age. Um, and then as I got older, it was just how I connected with God. And I love to worship, um, like everywhere <laughs> in the car, here, in the shower. <laughs> I mostly connect with them when I'm just alone, like in worshiping. Um, but yeah. How, how, uh, maybe, how has worship impacted you? Any, any of you? How, how is worship or song or a lyric or, or something? How is it? Yeah, anything about that? I think you got something. Oh, there's a, there's a specific song. I always have something, Justin. <laughs> um, there is a specific song in my life that I always resort back to when I'm going through something really tough. And um, it's by Hillsong. It's Even When It Hurts. And if you've ever heard the song... There's so many good lyrics in that song, but um, one that really hits me every time um, is, oh my gosh, it's gone now. Yeah, mom brain. <laughs> um, it's even when it, I don't, I might mess this up, but the second part's the important part. Even when it hurts like hell, um, even, I will praise you. And then there's another part of it that says, um, even, even when, like, basically it's hard to sing, even louder than I'll sing your praise. So 
sorry, I made that really confusing. But um, one of the certain like situations I was in is I, I had a miscarriage and that brought me to like the lowest point I've ever been in my life. I've never felt grief quite to that capacity. And I just decided I'm at my lowest. So what else do I have to do but praise him? Like I just, I needed that to pull me out of that place. And I just put on like a playlist that was already made and that song came on and I, something changed in me that now I, I know like when I'm suffering, when I'm, my heart is hurting, I turn to praise because there's never been a time when worship has failed me. There's never been a time when praising God has failed me. And it helps honestly, like change, it changed my, um, my, my attitude and my outlook on the situation and really just helped change my heart in that moment. I really like that. I've shared before that um, my father-in-law passed away um, in 2020. And in, in that process, I had moments where I, I, I struggled to pray, where I couldn't even say words out loud. And I, I would ask others to, to pray um, with me. Um, but I know worship is that way, where sometimes the words just aren't there. And so let's borrow them from somebody else. And, and, and let, it, let it roll over you and, and then let it come out of you and kind of let it, let, it, let it affect you. That's so good. Any other thoughts on, on worship or your passion? Uh, I told is, them not to prepare, by the way. I said, don't, I, don't overly prepare. I forgot the lyrics I was going to talk about. <laughs> it's so much harder to do this when you're not behind a cage. And <laughs> cage being the drum cage. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, no, uh, what Justin was at, uh, kind of was trying to get us to dialogue this week. And he, um, he asked us, like, what, what was some of our favorite lyrics? And... Um, for me, it's from um, that kind of like d helps us c understand, get, kind of connect with worship in our own way. And for me, it's from the song um, "As You Find Me" by Hillsong. And th this is my favorite line where it says, "You are faithful and you are gracious, and I'm just grateful to think um, you don't need a single thing yet, still you want my heart." Um, and for me, it always it puts into perspective, right? Like God, he created the universe and like all the, um, the distant lands and the people, like sometimes in the North country, it, we, we forget that a uh, other world, whole other world exists. And, um, and for me, I don't know, like just, uh, growing up in India, like watching, um, the, the different culture of worship there and even traveling to places like Uganda, just watching how God is, reaching for all people it doesn't matter who they are and in, in their own respective ways even even up here like for example some people interact with worship a lot different like you're not gonna see justin doing the dougie during worship you know <laughs> but but he's still he's still reaching for us and and i don't know that just i don't know for me it's it's super uh impactful Interesting. I just want to encourage those too. I mean, uh, my family, Amy and I had, it's had a lot, a rough last couple of years. Um, it, it, it a lot of stuff has gone on with us personally and, and within our family. And initially, um, you know, I was feeling it was very sort of dry season and, and things kept getting piled on and, and, uh, We've come through that, and we're not all the way through everything, but we've come through that spiritually, and the road back to us being healthy spiritually started with worship. It was, uh, and Gabe and Kristen touched on this a couple weeks ago, you know, you don't necessarily have to feel it in order to worship. He's always worthy whether or not um, we're in the right place or not. So in our in our road back, it started with worship. It started with just worshiping him, praising him, even if we didn't completely understand it, but it was sort of the catalyst for us that sort of propelled us back into a worshipful lifestyle. And so I just want to encourage anybody who's just feeling distance from God, 
and you, you know maybe maybe praying you you're not there or you know you don't want to read about it i would just read about him i would just encourage you just to step into worship and just even if you don't feel it even if you don't understand it just step into that spot and worship him because he's worthy and i promise he'll meet you there i've, I've been talking about um presence and god specifically god's presence and and we see a, a change in, in in the scriptures where god's presence kind of is in a spot in the, in the old testament but then in the in the new testament when when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all people, that that He's He's available, He's there, he, He's with us. And maybe, do you have anything just regarding experience or 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 hope or desire or just something in you that feeling God? <laughs> like, do you have anything on that? Or what has that been like for you? Just actually experiencing the presence of God. Kind of putting it up, put put you know, on the spot here. I feel like I can kind of go back to what I was saying before. Like sometimes I like in my life, there's times where I feel like I'm walking hand in hand with God, and then there's other times I feel like He's ahead of me and I'm like being dragged. And like, but the thing that never changes is that He has my hand whether he's beside me or he's in front of me. And I feel like going through some like really hard things um, in those moments I've had, you, you get to your lowest and you feel like I've got nothing else to give or I, there's nothing, I have no energy. I, I just can't do it. The something for me is God has never, even if I feel distant, like he's in front of me dragging me, the, the thing that never changes is that he's always there. And um, I definitely have moments where I'm like, I am not feeling it right now, God. And in those moments, I put worship music on and whether I'm like cranking it because my kids are screaming in the background, but sometimes you just have to, um, you have to choose to hear his voice. And in those moments is when I feel him closest because I feel like there's nothing else that I have to give except to just surrender myself and listen to what he has to tell me in that moment to get me through that. I texted you guys a couple of days ago saying, do you sing loud in the car? You didn't answer. Oh, it's fine. You don't have to, but... And uh, part of part of what was behind even that question is, and I've said this before too, that that for me, I, I know that our volume is on the higher end <laughs> during during worship in here, and I like that personally because I I guess I could become a better singer, but I, but I haven't taken any vocal lessons, and I I don't feel like I can sing well, but I do like I do feel like I can sing loud when you guys are playing loud, because <laughs> it drowns. I don't have to hear myself. <laughs> Um, and just, I, I, I love that. Like, turn, turn up the volume. My mom used to turn up the volume when she was vacuuming, and the house would be shaking. She's a rocker. The house would be shaking. She's like, you hear that bass line? Hey, that bass is so, is, is so, is so good. Uh, but I, I, like, I like just to let it wash over me so that I can just let loose in a sense, which let, letting loose for me is a little bit different than letting loose for other people. But... Um, yeah. Any other thoughts on, on worship or just encouragement for us? Um, I don't know. Come I, out of the cage, Josh. <laughs> um, for for me, it, it's uh, whenever um, you know when I'm when I'm not playing. For me, whenever I, I come in, whether it's just in, into the sanctuary to worship or in my own personal time, um, you know, like like Gabby said, sometimes you 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 know, on the in those moments where you um, you feel God like super close to you, and you're on a, in a on a mountain top in in that season of your faith, um, it's always so so easy to just come in, look at the lyrics, and you're like, yeah, I'm in. But then some you're some some days or some months or some years. 
you can just be like, man, what well, like these lyrics, they don't, they don't like what, what they're saying. It's just not what I'm feeling. But for me, it's always the, like you have in, in that, in those moments, you have to choose in that moment to, to really press into those lyrics rather than, um, I don't know, kind of be complacent in that moment. And I, 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 I'm not, I, I'm still learning how to do that. I, I feel like I'm, more often than not, I, I, I tend to not press in, but we just have to make that choice because, um, I don't know, the God, Jesus made the biggest choice, right? Coming down and, and giving our lives so that we can, um, we can, we can have eternal life and just be, um, our, our full selves. So why, why, why not just press in in those moments? I think, um, we, this is a space you know that that we set aside you know geographically as a, as a place to to encounter god and as i said god can be encountered everywhere you know in your car in your shower when the kids are screaming god god can be encountered encountered anywhere but there's also there's there's places that that can be particularly like easier <laughs> like this this is we know that this is a place to come to come and worship and i know that there's like even um People talk about thin places where it just seems like, man, that God is in that, that, that God is in that space, and we see people say that throughout the scriptures, or, or even um, you know, there's moments when when the sun is setting over the water, and it's like it just you're overwhelmed with the beauty of, of God's creation. It's so much easier to to see the beauty when the beauty is right right in front of you, you know. So we 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 try to to steward. Um, this space to be a place where we can come and worship, but that doesn't negate your car <laughs> or, or or your closet or or your your stereo or or even just going on a walk um, and and seeing. And so we our our hope is that is that you continue to encounter God more and more in your every day, and then also come on Sunday and kind of get filled up and get encouraged and encourage one another and. Let let Gabby sing over you, and let 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 Josh play the drums, and and Bill hit those bass chords, and and just let it let it wash over you, because because we we want to we we don't just want to survive, we want to thrive in life, and we're gonna do that one together, but but also with uh, the continued awareness of of God's presence, and it not just be about this space and this moment, and and when when we're singing for that, that half hour, 35 minutes on a Sunday, but if it carry, carries through into every every space, every moment, every interaction, um, when, when we bring that intentionality, it, it makes a huge difference. Anything else? Oh, you got something. Um, I just really wanna encourage you to like press into worship. And like, um, I know that it can be like kind of weird sometimes, especially if you don't are not a big worshiper, but um, I'm really starting to see it in our younger generation. Like the youth group, they like now are starting to come to church on Sunday at like 4.30 just to worship before like the service even starts. And they are so on fire for God right now and it's amazing and they just love to worship. So I just encourage you guys to like, just really present to worship, even if it feels weird at first, but. That's just, it's simple for me because that's how I connect with God on a deeper level, but yeah. Sarah, if you want to come and play behind us, why don't we all, all stand? You guys can stay up here and, and pray with me. If any of you want to pray, please, um, please do. We're going we're to end, end this morning and end, end this, this talk and just turning our attention to God and, and asking for his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And even as uh, I read that, that scripture from Revelation 21, that there's this picture that John gives us at the end of time where all tears are wiped away and all, everything has been restored and God's presence dwells with his people in a, in, a, in a way that we have never seen before, but in a way that we are progressively seeing. Because just like in, in the Old Testament, they, they had the presence in their midst but because of their choices and, and because of because of what was happening that day, it was it was a little bit separated. But then, because of what Jesus did, he he throws the the curtain back and the door is wide open, 
and says, come into my presence and experience me. So I want to encourage you, wherever you're at, whether this is your thousandth time here or your first time here or your, your first time asking these questions, God is available to you. His presence is available. And because of what Jesus did, we're able to enter into his presence freely. And those passages, and, and there's so many passages like it in the scriptures that talk about when we live under the law, you know, we keep having to follow the law and we keep, we, we're in this, this, this endless cycle of trying to do the right thing and, and earn it. But when we live under grace, when we live under what Jesus did, he earned it for us and he made a way for us so that no matter who you are or what you've done, what you did this morning, what you did this week, God's presence is available to you. And you don't have to earn your way in. You just have to come. You just have to respond. I don't know if anybody wants to pray, but I'll, I'll start. Jesus, we thank you, God, God, for, for what you've done for us and how you've given us this, this incredible gift that is song so that we can put words to our thoughts, words to our feelings and inspire words in us, God, as we worship you, as we experience you, God, as we love you. God, we give you the space. God, we give you our space. God, may we each individually be a temple that you can fill. God, may we experience your presence everywhere and let that presence change us. God, as we acknowledge who you are and what you've done and, and, who, and who you are, who you will be in us. God, as you long to see captives set free, as you long to see people healed, as you long to see depression fade, addiction fall off. God, may us continue to encounter your presence together and individually. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. Just a couple of reminders. There's the, the, the bake sale uh, to benefit the, the trip to New York City, as well as uh, vacation Bible school um, downstairs for anybody that wants to volunteer with that. Be blessed. Have a great week.